For animals to move around, they need to break down complex macromolecules through mostly through respiration. And to respirate, animals need oxygen. Now, our atmosphere is only about 20% oxygen, and underwater, oxygen is even harder to come by. So the question becomes, how do animals pull oxygen from their environment and then put their carbon waste products back into their environment? Over millions of years, different animals have developed different ways of achieving this, and the complexity of the systems are usually directly proportional to the complexity of the animal. This system, of course, is called the respiratory system. Now, as you can see on this slide, I have different animals displayed here. You have a cheetah, and she is a very fast animal, and it uses lungs. We have a human here who also uses lungs. We have fish who, as you probably know, use gills. Now, insects such as this insect up here, you can actually see it flying, and it uses a lot of energy when it flies. They use something called a a branch tubing system that goes throughout their entire body called the tracheal system. This bird here actually uses lungs too, but it uses lungs in a very different way than humans do. So as this podcast progresses, I'll show you each how each of these animals uses their respiratory system to extract oxygen from the air and re remove their CO2 from their body. Now everyone should probably recognize this system here. This is the human respiratory system. And most people are familiar with how lungs work, but we're going to review it anyways. Air is drawn in through the mouth and the nose area and brought down the trachea. Now, it splits off. Here, let me get a different thing. It splits off at, in the, to the bronchus or the bronchi and goes into the two separate lungs. Now, in the lungs, there are these little air sacs called alveoli. And they expand and contract when the diaphragm, this muscle here, moves up and down, causing a vacuum effect or to squeezing out all the air from the lungs. In this way, the lungs move in and they breathe out again. And this draws in oxygen-rich air. Then there's an exchange across a membrane where the oxygen goes into the bloodstream and the bloodstream dumps off its CO2 byproducts and the CO2 exits the lungs again when we exhale. We're going to get more into how lungs take in and how actually any animal takes in and oxygen and releases CO2 across the membrane a little bit later and the things that are involved in that. Now birds, as you can see, birds also have lungs, but their lungs work a little differently and actually more efficiently. The bird to cycle air all the way through its respiratory system actually inhales and exhales twice which is really neat actually. So the bird first inhales and air comes down its throat and into the posterior air sac. Now this air sac you can think of like a bellow, one like a bellows, and the bellow or the posterior air sac when it exhales the first time squeezes the air into the lungs. Now as it goes through the lungs it exchanges oxygen and CO2 like our lungs but instead of stopping at a dent and, and returning back out it actually gets squeezed into the anterior air sacs. Now, these anterior air sacs inhale to bring in the air, and they exhale again, and, to ex and then they exhale and shoot the air out of the bird, as you can see over here, too. That's a, the other half of the equation. Now, what this allows the bird to do is, instead of bringing in air, oxygen-rich air, stopping in a dead end and doing all the exchanges, and then pushing it out through the now, well, now they're pushing out the now oxygen depleted air through the new oxygen rich air and stuff and just gets really, really messed up. This way, the here you can see a blown up version of the tubes through which the air moves when it's in the lungs, really high surface area with the pock marks and stuff. The air just moves through in one direction, one direction only. And that really helps out the bird because the bird can then more efficiently extract oxygen from the air, which is necessary because the bird has to keep itself in the air with the movements of its muscles in flight. Now, as we move on next slide, we'll see fish. Now, everyone knows that fish breathe through gills, but most people don't really know how that actually works. So, when a fish here, just resize this a little bit. Well, maybe I can. Let me try this. There we go. So, when fish bring water into their mouths. This is the first step. They bring water into their mouths. Whoop. 
Here we go. Into their mouth, in here. I'm going to do a little drawing. And they, then they close their mouth, shut it right up. And they squeeze their mouth with their mouth, and the water jets out of their gills like that. And that allows them to run it across the surface through which they exchange their gases. Now, a gill, if we zoom in on a gill here, we'll see that it's actually made out of long spindly fibers. And the water doesn't actually go along the fibers in a lengthwise fashion. Instead, it goes across them the way the arrows are going. Now, if we look over at these over here, you can see the fibers are actually made out of little discs. And inside the discs are capillaries. And the oxygen-rich blood, well, the oxygen-poor blood comes into the discs, spreads out through the capillaries, where it meets with the water coming through, and then it rejoins the oxygen-rich blood. Now, it uses something called a countercurrent exchange, which we'll get into a little later, to make it the most efficient extraction method possible for the fish. But, safe to say that it's not as straightforward as it would seem. Now here we see a closer look at how gills work. And gills, if you want to pause it and read all the little annotations and stuff, that'll really help. But the gills, I've shown how they go through the discs and stuff. But there's something called a countercurrent exchange, which is really interesting in that the water flows in this direction. But the blood flows in this direction. So, when the water is at its most oxygenated over here, the blood is at its most oxygenated. And when the water is at its least oxygenated, the blood is at its least oxygenated. And if we see the water and the blood, the water is always a little bit more oxygenated than the blood. So, if it was the other way around and the water was at its most oxygenated when the blood was at its least, by the end, the water would be at its least and the blood would be at its most, and there'd be more oxygen in the blood than the water. And if there's more oxygen in the blood than the water, the oxygen will actually diffuse out of the blood into the water, which is really inefficient, especially considering how little oxygen there is in the water anyways. Unless you're at a tidal area where it's really churny and oxygenated, but most fish don't live there. So this countercurrent exchange method really allows the fish to take advantage of the way that the water flows in only one direction across its gills just like in birds. Now all these animals that I've shown have been very complex animals and these complex animals which can range from the size of a whale shark or a whale actually that uses lungs all the way down to a tiny itty bitty humming, hummingbird or a really small fish. They use very complicated ways to bring water, I mean oxygen into their systems and then they spread that oxygen throughout their systems with a fully fledged circulatory system. Smaller animals don't have to do this as we look at the insects. Insects, if you realize, insects aren't very big. I know that's pretty obvious. That most insects aren't big at all. There's no insects that get much larger than a, a fist, a human fist. Now, insects aren't very big because they don't use a circulatory system to get the air all around their bodies. You say, Riley, what's that? There's a whole bunch of circulatory system. I can see that right there. Well, the thing is, this is not a circulatory system. This is actually an air tubing system called a tracheal system. It's a lot like the trachea, old, the trachea of our lungs, except it's spread throughout the entire insect's body. And if you can see, there are these itty-bitty holes on the side of the insect. And the air comes into those holes and spreads in these system of tubes throughout the, air, the insect's body throughout the entire insect. And there are no cells that are too far away from the, a tube that would prevent them from getting oxygen from the tube. And it just relies on simple diffusion for the oxygen in the air in the tubes to diffuse into the insect. Now, the air sacs are usually around places in the insect that require more oxygen and might need a storage of oxygen there. The air sacs can actually squeeze a little bit and increase the pressure in the tube system to allow for faster oxygen uh, absorption by the insect. It's funny, insect's blood isn't actually a circulatory system. 
more of a diffusion system in that the blood doesn't act, isn't actually in a closed space. It just runs around the organs and stuff so that the blood just flows in wherever the flood, blood can flow and the organs absorb the oxygen from the blood that way. Now as we've gone from complex to simple, we can find one of the most simple animals in the world, or groups of animals, are flatworms. Now flatworms only have a couple layers of different cells, as we can see here, and they're so thin and have such a large surface area, even these folds help with the surface area there, and they live in the water that they can just diffuse oxygen straight into their body. So they don't really have a respiratory system at all. They have a membrane of their outer cells, and that stays wet from the water, and oxygen just diffuses right into the flatworm, and it gets to every part of the flatworm needed. The branches that you see here are not a tracheal system like an insect. That's actually a digestive slash excretory system. And I hope that's helpful.